So there are a number of different, coming through history, there are a number of different styles. I'm just thinking the way in which musical notation. We have from the older sources, Cicero, Quintilian, and so on, our notation goes right back, our gestures, I should say, not the notation. Our gesture goes right back to the ancient Greek theatre. And uh, uh, Cicero, Quintilian, uh, they spoke about it particularly uh, well and at length, especially Quintilian in his uh, 11th book. He says, uh, well, don't we invite a person? Don't we reject something? Don't we turn our head away when we are afraid? So whilst the gestures aren't given as such in notation, because you saw on the, the overhead the script, uh, so that would be a vertical hand, all right? And that's a supine hand. I speak about that. Let's speak about the prone hand, the index finger, the inward, the outward, right? The backwards. We have different positions. So we see uh, lower music. This other word was, um, we have three down, horizontal, elevation, Venice. Venice is the god. And we uh, produce our notations, obviously, from later books, which have studied the earlier books. There are constant references in Austin about Quintilian, other writers, and uh, it goes right through. It isn't just only the Italian sources. We have English sources, we have German sources, we have French sources. They're all mentioned. And they all uh, really apply themselves well to the music. So when we go ahead, with uh, planning our musical item, which gestures to use. As uh, Daniela said so well, uh, we needed to work out what passions, firstly, do we see in the music? Because firstly, the composer was important, the librettist. We know that Monteverdi also changed the libretto to make it more poignant. So quite often the collaboration, the same as we have collaborated here, uh, they collaborated in those days. And um, Lully, for example, in the later period in France, also collaborated with his dance movement so that he then not only had the music composed in such a way that the dancers could be uh, better served, as the musicians had put it. So the collaboration was very much in vogue right through various uh, hundred years. Then we need to see where did the composer go with the script. So today, I cannot claim that we are 100% authentic. It's an impossibility. We can only be as honest as we make our research. Because we don't live in that period. And there might have been slight differences. But we are being told by the ancient writers to collect pictures, to collect, to collect woodcuts. To, to collect paintings, to have a look at statues. And the ancient Greek statues, if you view them, they all have a beautiful curvature of the body. Right? Nothing is box-like there. And you achieve that in bringing one foot forward, one slightly behind, and the, the stepping into it. Right? I can go a step backwards. I can go forward. So when I engage you, I would not say thank you, uh, well, yes, when I say thank you, I go back. When I want to engage you, I go forward, because that's an invitation. So basically, gesture uh, is used to involve you as an audience. It's a two-way highway. We get energy from you, and you will produce that energy of being involved through our gesture in making you feel what is being sung to for the performer they need to see everything they're singing it starts in here the uh, perception of what is it all about who is the character what am i talking about the development of the character and the characters you probably noticed we had placed them in different positions here was her kingdom here was security right hand the good side left hand, the bad side, all right? We have the water right in front of us. Tessio has left her. So we reject the bad. We invite the good. 
to answer a little bit of what it's all about. It, it's quite a study. You learn it really like uh, we, we start learning uh, reading. We have to recognize our characters, uh, ABC, before we can read. And so it is with the gesture notations. We need to have, I call them technique classes. And once you have that, you have to be not selective of simply saying, oh, I've used this one too often, so I use that one. If it doesn't have, make any sense, don't use something. Right? But you use both hands too. You don't use just one hand. Yes. yes. I take it the audience back in Montevideo's time would have quite comprehended what you've just been showing us. Yes, and yeah. it was a language for the educated people. So in other words, if you wanted to be accepted at court, uh, then you needed to know about gesture. Because if somebody uh, said no to you, uh, you had to understand what that meant. But nowadays, we know it anyway. When we are happy, we say, come in. You're very welcome, don't we? We're using gesture all the time without, know, without knowing what we are doing, perhaps, but it comes from here. It is the natural language of the body. What we are speaking, as you brought out so well, is what the ear perceives. What we are gesturing to is what the eye perceives. And we have to have the inner truth. The inner truth means for us nowadays is that we have to study. We have to research, we have to examine the music, which we have done collaboratively, and uh, we see when we have dissonances, and the accented syllable is so important. So when we are changing an Italian piece in a different language, we have problems. Mm -hmm. We have to gesture in the original language. And if the translation isn't done very well, we have problems because the music doesn't quite fit the words anymore. Mm. Because of this dilemma. Um, I have. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Was it me or the lady in front? Oh, sorry, Daniela. Yeah, I did have a question. That's okay. Go no, you got it. Okay. It's fine. Claire first, and, and then Michelle. I wanted to congratulate you. It's fantastic to be at uh, what is effectively a world premiere. So it's yes. really splendid. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you very much. I want to ask you, as as, a, as the singer, um, what difference does it make to you? to actually have to work with the gesture. I mean, obviously, as a singer, you always... Oh, don't worry, worry. I can answer that straight away. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard work. Yeah. It's very, very hard work. Because I've done this piece without gesture. Yeah. That's and, what I'm interested in. Yeah, and I was, uh, I was work... It, it's a lot... Well, it has become a lot slower be because we've needed to put motion in. Um, but we're, we're in the process at the same time now of maybe fastening it up a bit to get it back to a, 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 a slightly faster pace. But it's, it, I was thinking, trying to work out why it was different. The obvious thing is you, you're having to um, look at individual words rather than, like, if, for instance, if I was doing it without gesture, I look at a piece of music and I say, okay, so that's what that sentence is saying. And, it, and you could put it in one word and say, okay, well, I'll think about that during that sentence or that phrase. But with the gesture, you can't do that because there's a reason for putting a gesture on a certain word. So straight away, you're having to dissect it. And so instead of uh, like saying, oh, Tezio, I, I miss you for that phrase, you know, you're having to say, okay, well, I miss you. Uh, because you're over there and, and you left me here because that's what the text is saying. So, yeah, it's, it's complicated. Very demanding. And it was very hard, it was very hard work. Mm. It was fantastic. <laughs> well, Tessa has been working on this with, with Helga for... Since about March, Since I think. March, yes. Mm -hmm. in, in a very involved process. Mm -hmm. And religiously. <laughs> Prayerfully. <laughs> you were very grateful. <laughs> my, my question was similar um, and related to um, memorization. Um, so you, you said you had already learnt um, the lamento before, so um, it's probably a slightly different question there, because I was wondering whether the gesture aided or complicated the work of memorization 
I'd, ha I'd had it memorised um, without gesture. Right. Then when I started putting gesture in, I couldn't do it without having to refer to the sheet of paper, and that took, that's what the really, really tedious part was, right. because I couldn't, I wanted to, I wanted to do it all, you know, but I couldn't because I couldn't remember, oh, this comes here and, and then I'm not doing the right, and then if I'm on the wrong foot, then, you know, I can't, oh yeah, then I've got to go back and, re and work out why it was, oh, yeah. So, um, in terms of, you would have to, I don't know whether you could do, whether it would be easier to do it all at once, mm. memorise a piece, yes. learn a piece and do the gesture all at once, it might be easier. Because you know, I wondered about that, that notion of embodiment um, from Melo Ponti, whether that would be coming into the role of, of memorisation for you. And I didn't hear, he, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry just, just that idea of embodiment. Mm. That, um, That's a really wonderful Some of us question. have been reading about reading. I've always been taught, stand and sit, you know, yeah. and it's like that, and this is it. But mm. no, we are telling a story, and that story is is declamation, but it is also within the body and our facial expression and the hands and the position of the body. Are we hunched? Are we opened up? Mm. It really matters because then it engages our audience and it becomes believable. Mm. And, and so I've got another thing to add to that, just quickly. Um, when when I do, have done it before and I've done it with Glenis, I because I do tend as a singer to be sort of um, physical. Yes. And I would. I would go with the music, with the with the music, with the chord, and then sing. And it was hard for me to not do that because I had to wait for the word. So that was another sort of element to sort of just add to it. Mm -hmm. But what it has done too is give a much greater sense of depth in yeah. terms of, of the understanding of the text because you have to think about every word, um, and it certainly changed. Mm. The way they relate um, to each other from a, a continuum point of view as well. Mm. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, it's said of gesture that it empowers the, uh, the performing artist um, in a number of ways, but most importantly to transport the audience, to capture them. And today, yet again, I've seen a, a, a performance where at the end we didn't want to clap. I've seen four of these now with different operas. How do you feel gesture today has enabled you, empowered you, to capture your audience? Or is that getting deep and meaningful beyond belief? It's hard because uh, it's just different. Yeah. I would say it's just different. Did you feel you, you had this in your hand? But I felt that way without gesture too. All right. Um, Good. With the st I felt that way with stillness as well, so, mm. you know, there, it's just another way of doing, mm. yeah. Thank you. I wanted to ask, um, the subject of gesture is very prominent in Commedia dell'arte, obviously, and uh, also the theory of embodiment. So did you look to the Commedia for any, um, any assistance in discovering gesture at all? I actually read it books on Comedia dell'arte, especially preparing for this mm. seminar paper. And um, there were plates of, as you could see, the Isabella Andreini's mm. with gesture. Um, but if you go back to print times, you will see the statues and the gesture on the vases or cups. Um, and you will see that through Roman times, then in the books on Comedia dell'arte, either from Italy or France, there were some pretty good books with archival Material. And then it goes back to the 19th century, the end of the 19th century. And that stylized version of it is all there. And it is for noble characters, where uh, uh, a villager would be, you know, like that. And then another character would be different. So there would be that decorum and, and carriage of the lady. So the tragic characters would, would employ that stylized form of it. And the concept of gesture is really a form of language in itself. That as so, it may have the ability to transcend the language barrier. And like seeing here, the gesture being so precise means that it's regardless of the language you're performing, you have the ability to understand really understand yes. what's going on. And I thought you did an amazing job. Thank you. That's a very good point. Thank you. Well, Dean Van Nett is here.
called that the Cicelonian position. <laughs> and this is what we are aiming for. The Comedia dell'arte, we have more imitation. And we are told for tragedy, we mustn't imitate. Unless we have a zany uh, character in it or something like that. But uh, you probably saw the different gestures which uh, Tessa displayed when she became really mad and out of, out of her mind and says the orca should come and pick his bones clean. So we're using not any more elegant, courtly hands. We are using hands which are wide open. And we quite often now in our theatre, you know, you have a magnificent tenor and he will sing off his love for his lady and he goes like that, right? <laughs> How much more refined would that be? Love for the man was that finger. Love for the woman was that under the bosom. A lot of things have meaning. And even so, you don't catch all the meanings, but the refinement, this is what was seen in those earlier periods because they were our patrons. They paid the money. And they wouldn't have anybody representing them unless they saw the grace within the actor singer. If you were not graceful, you wouldn't get those roles. You would get the media roles. And even uh, in books of that earlier time, accounts of all the various uh, operas and such, it's being mentioned that those people who couldn't act so well, they would have lots of props or they would be put in stage machines. So you admire the stage machine and you can't act so well. But the wonderful singer, we have her right in display of everybody and everybody can see the good things and the bad things, the ones which were acceptable at court and the ones which were not. So the hierarchy demanded quite a lot. It's very hard to get out of that. Uh, well done. Uh, I did enjoy very much uh, uh, the performance. Excellent. Uh, uh, well done. My question is twofold. Uh, I'm building on Mark's uh, question initially. Uh, it's on why. So why bother? Why in 21st century you need to do that? And what is the place of really reviving the gesture, the meaning, linking to the music, to the uh, libretto uh, in the Lady Gaga uh, era? <laughs> Post Mick Jagger era. <laughs> Why bother? Why bother? Because Lamento de Rihanna by Monteverdi is such a canon in the repertory. And nearing an authentic, authentically well, truthful, honest representation of the passions within is something that, that hasn't been done uh, so that it was captured. So we would like to capture it and to be as precise as Cicero uh, wanted to be. Um, and we would like to discover in the process what that feels like in terms of performance practice. We would like to inform the performance practice of the vocal delivery of it. But we would also like, as a scholar, I would like to see, well, how does visual delivery affect the music and the content of the text? And the, how does that, if has it has had an effect on the musical setting of the text? And musicologists have always been concerned with that particular text setting because it is exemplary in the literature of one of the best marriages between words and music and that is always problematic, especially in opera. Well, why bother with gesture in the age of Lady Gaga? Well, Lady Gaga uses gesture all the time. Not in the stylized version of it, but she is very particular as to her visual image and very particular about everything that she does. She plans for it and she knows that there will be a particular impact that will be achieved. So why should not operatic classical singers employ gesture to do the same as Lady Gaga? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that, sir. Uh, you worked very hard on that. It's very appreciated work for today. My question is for Tessa. Um, what's the challenge for a singer and actor to embody uh, gesture with the emotion? Because I know you're focused on gesture, so... No, it's the... It, um, 
they come together really. I mean, you have to. The emotion really, I, I, I think, comes first. Um, so we actually went through the piece and uh, agreed that this is what you're sort of experiencing here as the singer. And then the, the gestures sort of mirror that. And um, when I first started doing it, I, I first, a, a lot of it was in my mind. And that, that all, I said, oh yeah, I can do this, fine. Then I got up in front of the mirror and then tried to put the gesture on the word and do everything that I was supposed to do. And it was like I had dyslexia. I just could not do it. I really couldn't. And I'm surprised that actually I, I got to this point that I could do it. Because there was a point when I, I thought, oh, I, I'm just not going to be able to do everything all at the same time. And it's amazing what you can do when you, you know you give yourself some time. And um, so uh, uh, now the, it's all one thing. And I'm, I'm beyond the point of now worrying about exactly what it looks like and more of how it feels, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's very interesting because I was reminded a little bit of uh, Kabuki and No Theatre where it's not similar where you have very codified gestures uh, that you know, the performer learns. <coughs> And it's up to them to you know, bring the emotion to that gesture. But I think it's interesting because we're talking about a very old gesture system here in European theatre. But I think there's an analogy they can make with Oriental theatre. Oh, yeah, yes. Well, theatre as well. Yes. Yes. Kindle drama as well mm. uses a very stylized version of it with the different mudras. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, th I think from the point of research where we really examine uh, the text and the music and such, it, it is actually, it gives you a deeper insight into anything, be it poetry or uh, be it a musical item. You, you go deeper into it and you start to ask yourself the questions. Like when I'm working with somebody, be it a singer or be it an actor, I don't, uh, the, the, the piece we have gestured is not going to be that universally everybody would agree with what we did. It was the version between the singer and me in that regard and, and with the input from Tessa and we worked together. Um, I had, for example, when we met first, I said to, and we discussed our first bits and, and such, and we went through the gesture again. Uh, I said to Tessa, what I want you to do before I come back next time, I want you to examine the piece and think of all the emotions or passions you can feel are in the various script, in the various libretto. If I dictate and say, no, no, this is really such and such, because it has to be made truthful to the performer. She is the performer, not me. I, I can help and I can discuss and I can uh, encourage. And then we can, and it was very interesting when I mentioned this passion and that passion, and then uh, all of a sudden Tesla would say, no, not quite. And we would search for the word which both we were, uh, had the proper meaning and made sense to both of us. Now, I have had um, students and people which did the same aria with me. I don't go back to the first gesture, uh, gesture to piece I did with anybody prior to if it's a new person. But I, I would say, okay. Uh, let's, let's gesture it and we go through the whole process again and I've got a new person to work with. What would be interesting for me would be to write a paper on and uh, compare on the different pieces and see the differences because it is not that gesture is a static uh, way of just saying yes, now you must do this and now you must do that and now you must do this. No, nothing to do with that. If the inner truth isn't there for the performer, that performer cannot give the truthful uh, performance of that particular character. This um, is a really good point, Helga, because the, the actor-singer needs to undergo the same processes an actor would um, go through to actually reach the character, to, to find the character within. And in the Comedia dell'arte books, I found references to the fact that this was the first art form in which a character, uh, 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 an actor, would actually identify with their character. This was the first art form where this actually occurred. And it is interesting that uh, um, Andreini was the first to perform this lament, and she was, she, she was of that tradition.
Mm. And, and the other thing we have also to, to keep in mind, the, the costuming. Now, yeah. if we did Ariana in a modern costume, uh, it would look perhaps a bit odd. We could do it in just being plainly dressed. And we have done performances. We did, um, uh, and, and ladies have performed men as well. We, we, had, uh, we have a wonderful actress uh, in Melbourne, Annabelle Green, and she did The Highwayman. And uh, she, as a woman, performed it. And we, we discussed costume because it's just so important. And we decided, okay, we stay with a dark black garment she wore, three quarter long dress. Uh, and it is amazing how the gesture produces for the audience the scene. And just now pops nothing. And you saw here, stark curtains. Mm -hmm. But we, we had, I'm sure, I said, oh, here is your, your home, your security, and such. And we, we worked all on, on those. We have the ocean. Now, we can't move those things in our performance. And what you see a lot with our modern performances is that uh, if somebody sings about their homeland, right, and then somebody sings about a, a, a wonderful tree, that tree all of a sudden moves. It moves on this to, to that stage. So you say, oh, God, where's the tree again? Well, you can't move a tree. You can't move a house unless you put a house on the way. And like in Australia, you can see it sometimes. But what is, what is there is there, and you can have the scene imprinted on your mind that you can act without having those props on stage, but you have to be really able to see them. So uh, uh, Tessa had to see her homeland, mother and father, huh? and her cradle. If you notice, she went down to Puna. She went further down. That's where she was born. Tessa, what did it feel like to work with this particular costume? And then I will ask Shane about the design. It's lovely. Love it. Mm -hmm. oh, I want to wear it all it the time. Was, it, was, <laughs> it was actually made especially for her. So this is her costume. Mm -hmm. That's what, great. What, what is it? What's the difference? Well, th but there's one thing that I probably didn't get quite all totally right tonight. tonight and it's with one thing with, with the elbows. Helga was saying to me when I was practicing it without the costume, think of your elbows, that they're, they're not like this a lot. And okay, that's fine, so I sort of corrected it. But then with the, the dress, it needed to be so much more exaggerated because, you know, you've got, got it all going on. So that was, that's one thing that the costume actually changed. How about this collar and, and this lovely cape that you used? The, the collar feels fine. Yes. Yes, and I love the hair, yeah. Yeah, the cape's great. It's all great, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Would you tell us a little bit about the, the design of the costume? Uh, well, in, in this period, um, <clears throat> theatrical costumes were based on court dress, contemporary court dress. And, um, but then often, say for example, in this, it was set in the classical time. So there would be tokens of a period tacked onto a court dress or a male costume. You know, the cape, you know, the, the drapery is to give that sort of Greek feel. And the tiara is more like a sort of classic Greek diadem. And basically what it's doing is it's equating to what we do now, often in theatre, um, with, um, where we will do Shakespeare or something in modern contemporary costume of now to try and influence the audience that it is, you know, the scenario is about hu our humanity. You know, and as um, Daniela said earlier in her um, dissertation, nothing has changed. You know, our emotions, our humanity is the same. <coughs> the decoration is different, but the essence is identical. And so therefore, the, the audience would have seen Ariana dressed as they would dress. And so therefore can relate more personally to the character. Um, it's only in recent times that we would say maybe put her in either Greek costume or con you know, plain, contemporary, or whatever. So I want to show you what you keep talking about. Oh, the shoes. Oh, you shoes. have to see the shoes. Oh. Isn't that explicit? It doesn't fit me. But it is actually, it was actually 
is Shui from Tessa. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, as you can see, like a Cinderella shoe. Very, very small. But very, very close to the style. Very close the to the style of the period. And Shine added that. Yeah. And that's the sort of thing you can do. And uh, uh, well, that's, that's the count. I want. I would like to ask Andrew um, and the crew about the concept of capturing this performance because this we've never done. Or this thing hasn't. But we don't think it has been done ever. So. What was your recipe of capturing it? Um, well, it's like I mean, we were just very conscious of, sort of, like you said, capturing the gestures and making sure that was the focus and focusing on the movement and the body. So um, we were just sort of making sure that we, after a few rehearsals, it was sort of hard at first to know where she was going to move next and where the hand was going to go and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. rehearsing without gesture and then with the gesture how you were able to see to feel and to really pass this one to the performance to the audience did you see any difference did you consider that more or, more or less I, I'm just here to play I will play my piece that, that's all I would never play the same this, this piece the same twice um, it will always depend very much, um, it, it is a real collaboration with the singer. So it depends on just the intensity of the word, how many notes I put in the chord, um, how quickly she moves, um, how much is necessary, how much isn't. So you're not, you're not playing what's on the page at all. Um, you're, you're, I was going to say making it up, but you're improvising. Mm -hmm. Of course, you, you, you've got the basis there from Monteverdi. Um, but the rest has to be a, a textualised um, concept and, um, and hopefully enhance what's happening with, with the text. What, what did change, um, as Tessa mentioned, having performed this before and not the whole thing, the, the shortened version, 
was there is a, a different sort of concept of depth, I think, that we really went through. And yes, to start with, the whole thing slowed down a lot. It actually became a little more difficult for a while because when things slow down and you're playing harpsichord, you have to put more in because you have to sustain the sound, um, which is also why it's wonderful to have the gamba to be able to play to sustain the bass notes. Um, in other performances, you would possibly and uh, you know have maybe harpsichord as well, but definitely some sort of arch lute where you have really beautiful resonant bass strings um, and. A, a, in a sense, a lot more freedom to come in and out of the texture um, because that instrument isn't so immediate as, as the harpsichord. But um, anyway, I hope that answers your question. Catherine, what was it like? I was noticing with your three recordings, or was it four? Yes. Yeah. The, the, the accompaniments were all different. Mm. Um, there was one with the yeah. there was one with um, a plucked instrument plus a very, very sustained, very low instrument, and I'm not sure about the others, but I, as a gamma player, I found it difficult in, to, to play in this situation uh, because of the feeling that one needs to be together. Um, and one way to, I suppose, uh, I learned something from listening to that um, deep, was it not so, uh, figure as, um, the solution they came up with was to have a completely sustained string part because um, I was I was trying to do sort of recitative or seco and trying to get with um, Clemens who was trying to get the, you know stay with the singer so uh, I found it really quite quite uh, challenging and next time I do it if I ever do it I would I'd try and think of another way actually. <laughs> 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 Play the double bass or something <laughs> like that. But I think the, the GABA has a good role to play in, you know, that it does sort of um, put a bloom on on the sound. Mm -hmm. But the beginning of the notes, the beginning of every note is, is a difficult one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, yes, please. Uh, congratulations, That's really good. Um, how do you think your perform having just performed it with the gestures and wearing that gorgeous costume, how do you think your performance compared to the way that you've sung it in the past um, using your own um, gestures? Uh, well, it was slower yeah. and more, deli more deliberate. And I think that if I were to do it without gesture again, um, it, it would be improved, put it that way. Which I think I, I like what I've come up with now. Mm. And I found that um, when I uh, was practicing it without gesture just recently, I suddenly found that I felt very steady. Um, my breathing was a little better than it used to be. And I think it's, uh, I, don't, I can't explain exactly why. But uh, then again, when I put, started putting the gesture on top of that, it got a bit unsteady again because I was doing more stuff. But vocally, it's helped. It has has actually helped me, I think. Mm. More questions? I only feel, having come from Melbourne for this, the journey was well worthwhile, and I feel deep down thanks is due to the university for even tackling such a project, not to mention Daniela leading the team, but um, to have a really good film of gesture being done in such a fashion is an immeasurable asset to the cause of the art being promoted. So especially thank the team photographing and sounding because that's just beyond price. But it wouldn't have worked without such a performance, without such a costume, without such encouragement and wonderful games of playing. Thank you, Shane, for the costume especially. So please convey our thanks, I'm sure, of everybody to the university authorities because this was an ambitious project and it's turned out wonderfully. I thank think. you, Mark. Well, you did my job. The only thing you didn't do is actually th thank Helga. I can't. Because she is your wife. <laughs> <laughs> I need to thank Helga because if she was, she, if she was not there, if she wasn't teaching gesture, yeah. 
I would have been totally ignorant. And yeah. if she wasn't there in this instance for this project, I would have not taken it. Because I know how much um, expertise and time and effort goes into it. And uh, her presence here is the decisive moment and factor in this project. So I'm very grateful. Can you go? Well, they, I like to have the last word, if I might. Because the reason why I am so glad that I was invited is that Dean Barnett here at Flinders University, with whom I studied some years ago, and it was, uh, okay, and I won't want to go into that, but he, uh, <laughs> no, it, it's personal, it, 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 my, our son died not very long afterwards, but he changed my life, and I know he changed my husband's life with what he taught me. And uh, uh, to bring back to Adelaide what he has given me, and that's not to say that I got everything from Dean, I did see him again in Melbourne. He was already very ill uh, prior to his death, about a year and a half. And I don't think he remembered me at all. Um, but he said three things to me, three words. Study, study, study. And that's what I like to pass on to the younger generation. And you will find it's very, very rewarding. I don't think Daniela and I would ever be without study, would we? And I don't think we as can. Well, we can. What a but wonderful it is message to be um, delivered in a university context. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is enriching. And you see, you, your life expe you know, yes. expands. Mm -hmm. it is, I see so many things. I can watch television, I can watch uh, a part on SBS about the history of, of uh, Rome and the culture and such. And all of a sudden they speak about the wedding ring. Well, I start to research, where was the wedding ring? Was it on the right hand of the lady's finger or the left hand? The lady does it that way, right? And then, you know, this, this is what I mean. It makes you really uh, into alert and, and, and you get an inquiring mind. And that's what you should be. We should watch each other. You see gesture being present, presented to you all the time. Any lecturer can tell you, when they go into the classroom, who is bored, who is tired, who is was, who's interested. Even the way how you would be seated, you know, if you sit like this, or if you sit like this, or you play with your perhaps something else. Um, but the alertness, you start to sit forward. Look at paintings, it will change your life. Read the painter's brush, they all knew about gesture. They had to. You couldn't. You couldn't paint a beautiful lady of the courts of being paid for it unless you knew something about them. And they brought out the character. So look at the small thing. Gesture has nothing to do with being flamboyant. It's in the small thing which matters. So a slight movement like that. And even in the old books they said, maybe not everybody noticed it, but the educated person did. So, but study, study, study is my last, these are my last three words. Thank you very much. Thank you.